What's going on my fellow rock and rollers? Don't forget to hit the bell notification icon to be notified every time I put out a new video on my channel. This is a band that's been requested by a lot of people and we're talking about the group Jellyfish. They were a short-lived band based out of California that only lasted for about half a decade and put out two studio albums but they would be hugely influential and develop a cult following. The nucleus of the band was made up of drummer and singer Andy Sturmer and keyboardist Roger Joseph Manning Jr. The pair would cycle through a revolving lineup of instrumentalists, and today we're talking about the story of Jellyfish, a band that ended too soon. The band's story dates back to the 70s when Andy Sturmer and Roger Joseph Manning Jr. met in high school in San Francisco and bonded over their love of all things jazz, post-punk, and British pop. Sturmer played in a high school jazz band and showed promise as a gifted musician who could sing and play drums at the same time. Manning would tell Classic Rock Magazine, I've never seen anyone of his age with that expertise and command of his instrument. Andy was one of the first kids in our town who took it seriously and had a goal. He was my hero, he'd say. Following high school, Manning moved to Los Angeles and was admitted to the University of Southern California to study musical composition, and he soon became enamored with the local music scene. LA at the time was alive to the sounds of post-punk, the birds-obsessed Paisley Underground movement, and most prominent of all, glam metal which was exploding from the Sunset Strip, but Manning would be captivated by an LA band that stood apart, the flamboyantly attired pop rockers Red Cross. Soon enough, Sturmer and Manning would join the act Beatnik Beach, which was signed to Atlantic Records. They would soon leave the group after collaborating with one another, and they developed their own musical style. And in 1989, they formed the group Jellyfish. Combining the musical stylings of the Beatles, Cheap Trick, ELO, and Queen, Jellyfish would become pop rock pioneers and develop what many would consider their own unique sound. Even after the pair left Beatnik Beach, they were still technically signed to Atlantic Records, but they weren't a priority for the label. The band's career began at a time when rock music was undergoing a massive shift from more pop influenced and hair metal to the dark gloomy sound of alternative rock at the turn of the new decade. Jellyfish didn't really fit what the record labels were trying to push in the early 90s. The aesthetic of the band was completely off the wall. Think steampunk meets psychedelic hippie. In a 1993 LA Times article, Sturmer said the group, and I quote, never tried to suck up to any genre of music. We just did what came naturally to us and didn't worry about it. After they were signed to Atlantic Records, they recorded over the course of a year and soon became the subject of a bidding war with eight labels. The band would eventually settle with Charisma Records, who gave the band total creative control. And their first record, Belly Button, was released on July 27, 1990, when hair metal was still highly popular. The band was always aware of that fact that they were entirely contrary to what was going on in popular music at the time. The top performing single, Baby Coming Back, would hit the Billboard Top 100 charts, but album sales were kind of slow, only topping out at 100,000 units. The band's singles also got the video treatment, which got some play on MTV, but Jellyfish was far from being considered a household name. Despite that, they did find high-profile fans. The band would tour with the southern rock group The Black Crows, who took Jellyfish out on tour in 1991. Member Jason Faulkner would briefly join the group with the bait of a major label deal and would stay with them through the recording of Belly Button. Faulkner and Sturmer immediately clashed. In a 2014 Louder Sound online article, Faulkner said, I immediately had trouble with Andy. He's just a difficult guy. Andy had a real strong idea of what he wanted to do, and I found that my voice wasn't as loud. They weren't open to doing any of my songs, and I didn't want to be a sideman, he'd say. And with personality conflicts going on, Faulkner still had fond memories of the first album, Telling Louder Sound. It was a really exciting time making that record, but also bittersweet. The songs were the sweet bit. We were all very young. I was just 20, and Roger and Andy weren't that much older, but the music is very sophisticated. It was hard because Andy and I weren't talking, he'd say. Also joining the band on the album was Red Cross bassist Steve McDonald, and Steve wouldn't tour with the band, instead being replaced by Manny's younger brother Chris. The band would enlist producer Albie Galutin, who was also best known for working with the Bee Gees. He would also work on the band's follow-up album as well. As Jellyfish hit the road, the band turned their attention to developing a real stage presence. They spent 12 weeks rehearsing for a 50-minute live show, which included a white picket fence, a bubblegum machine, and an 8-foot tall statue of actor and Christian activist Gavin McLeod. In 1991, they were one of five openers for NXS at Wembley Stadium, and that's when the band started developing a cult following. Another aspect of their stage show was that the whole band would stand together in a line at the front of the stage, 
with Sturmer playing a stripped down drum kit while singing and standing. The band's wardrobe also caught people's attention as their onstage clothes were pretty colorful and seemed ripped from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and paid homage to the psychedelic feel of the 60s and 70s. Guitarist Jason Faulkner would tell Louder Sound how the band despised the whole grunge look at the time saying, We uniformly load the whole lumberjack rock star thing that was starting to happen. T-shirt and jeans and your crack showing when you lean down. We didn't want to be an everyman band at all. We wanted to be from outer space with a wink and a nod he'd say. While the tour to support Belly Button would win over fans, the constant close quarters only made existing tensions worse within the group and by the end of the tour Chris Manning and Jason Faulkner had left the band. Chris would go on to become a producer, while Jason left after being diagnosed with an ulcer in his early 20s, something he attributed to the stress of being in a band with Andy. And with Chris and Jason now gone, the band was just down to the main songwriting duo of Andy and Roger. In 1992, the pair had a few brushes with some major celebrities. The songwriting duo wrote five songs for Ringo Starr's 1992 solo album, with one of them being used called I Don't Believe In You and they appeared in the music video for Way to the World. They also had a failed songwriting session with Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, and the track would eventually appear on Manning's 2005 solo album called Solid State Warrior without a credit to Wilson. As the duo turned their attention to their second album, Spilt Milk, they enlisted some session musicians to replace their departed members. The sessions to create the album was pretty tumultuous, as some of the recording happened during the LA riots, and the band adhered to a grueling six days a week schedule. The album also proved to be an expensive endeavor for the band, who would end up creating a pretty varied record with mass choirs, strings, brass, flutes, and wind chimes among many other instruments. In fact, the album's title Spilt Milk was a reference to being over budget and behind schedule on the record. And Spilt Milk would prove to be a commercial failure, only peaking at number 165 on the Billboard charts. Sales numbers aside, the band did find more fans in high places, as Queen guitarist Brian May, who was out promoting his solo record at the time, Resurrection, spoke highly of Jellyfish in an interview, saying, We have the tape Spilt Milk on the bus. We like it. I can hear some influences, but they're going into new places. It's a very interesting group indeed. I'm glad our influence can be seen out there, he'd say. And things began to sour on tour for Spilt Milk when the musical differences between Sturmer and Manning intensified. Sturmer also resented the role of frontman and being in the spotlight. Manning would tell Louder Sound, Andy and I essentially had been together for six or eight years. We were getting complacent and bored with each other. Our differences as people were starting to magnify and musically, the exact same thing was happening. When we started putting together music for our third record, it was clear we were on very different paths. Manning knew the end was near when he dropped by Sturmer's house to talk about the band's third record. At the time, Manning was heavily into Wings, T-Rex, and Sparks, groups that are generally high-energy, fun, melodic pop with attitude, so he was surprised when Sturmer presented him with a song that was more reminiscent of Leonard Cohen. The band would officially break up in April of 1994 over a phone call. Throughout Jellyfish's career, they really didn't make much money. Not helping things was Sturmer's iron-fisted rule over the band. Manning would tell Magnet Magazine, Now I can look back on it and see that without wisdom, maturity, and maybe some counseling and therapy, we could have never worked our way through our problems. Had there been more money coming in, it would have justified some of the pain, he'd say. So what happened after Jellyfish, you're wondering? Well, Manning went on to start a new band called Imperial Drag with touring Jellyfish guitarist Eric Dover. Their sound veered more towards pop rock and was less heavily inspired by Queen than Jellyfish was. Meanwhile, touring member Eric Dover would go on to front Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash a side project, Snake Pit, in 1995. Meanwhile, Manning and former Jellyfish guitarist Jason Faulkner would put out two albums together, including 2000's Logan Sanctuary and 2006's TV Eyes, but they both failed to be successful commercially. Both Manning and Faulkner would also play with alternative rock artist Beck, while Faulkner would also put out a series of solo albums. Andy, for his part, would become pretty secretive about his post-Jellyfish work and declines to be interviewed. Sturmer would end up writing music for a number of animated shows for children, including Batman and Transformers, as well as for the Disney Network. Even after all these years, the relationship between Andy and Roger still appears to be tense, making a reunion unlikely. The pair had an offer to reunite for Coachella in the early 2000s, but Sturmer declined Manning's offer via his lawyer. Even as recently as 2008, Manning shot down the idea of a reunion, telling Magna Magazine, Except for Andy, we all speak to one another, some of us make music together, but nobody is interested in working with Andy in a personal or creative capacity. It would serve no purpose, but I don't say that with any animosity or sadness, he'd say. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again tomorrow on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.